It's my privilege to introduce uh, Stephen Hadrick, our next speaker. I met Stephen, I think it was 2007, and uh, during the last seven years, I've learned a lot of things uh, about Stephen. I'm not going to do the traditional introduction. I will tell you a little bit. He did go to Georgetown University. No, it's not working? It's going next door. Well, too bad. <laughs> Why do I care? They're not a part of my system. Yeah. Maybe a Why don't you take it away, Alice? I'm just going to yell, okay? All right, here we go. Can they hear that too? No. Yes. There it is. So he studied accounting and uh, uh, psychology, but he came, I think, to Devin's teachings from a very natural, uh, very natural way. And, uh, Deming's teaching, I think, are very natural. It's only when we go to school and get that beaten out of us and we replace it with other stuff that we start to see the change a little bit. Uh, uh, Stephen has a natural affinity for people and all the messiness in English that comes with managing people. And he likes to help them see all the things to be. He's also a man of great courage because during, the, you're going to hear about the financial struggle that the company's gone through, he put his personal uh, uh, checking a checkbook, etc., at risk, so he didn't have to lay anybody off during the tough times. I think probably my favorite thing, though, is that uh, I heard Stephen speak first about a year ago. There was a group of very cynical and skeptical CEOs, table company in a large organization, and he had originally given 45 minutes. That's all they would give him. He finished, they wouldn't let him leave for another two hours asking him questions. There were people, you know, standing at the back door with their hands on the bar, you know, push the door open so they could run to the restrooms. <laughs> they, it was like a hundred yard dash. They're standing like this. And everyone said, well, they just couldn't wait. What did I miss? So that probably embarrasses Stephen because he's also uh, pretty quiet. He likes to Sit back and listen. But anyway, I'd like to encourage him not to be too quiet. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Hadrick, please welcome him. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, welcome, everybody. I get the first um, talk after Kelly. I would prefer to talk after Einstein than talk after Kelly. <laughs> the bar is set quite high. Um, my company is a family-owned business. It was founded in 1878 by a non-family member. My grandfather had the courage in the Great Depression to buy a company because he felt his company, his uncle's company, wasn't fulfilling enough. And uh, our family became involved in 1930. I'm going to give you the next. 50 years very quickly, so I want to get on to the Deming portion. Uh, we're basically printers of packaging, whether it's vitamin labels, vitamin boxes, shampoo labels for food products, uh, general package printers we call ourselves. We use flexographic printing and offset printing. So my journey began in 1984 when my mother called me and said, uh, just to let you know, I, I, after Georgetown, I went to an accounting firm, Pete Mark Mitchell. My mother calls me in 1984, just by the way, the family, the family business that we've had since 1930s and doing so well, your father and your uncle aren't really getting along. They're not, they have no uh, vision. Just to let you know, it, I'm not asking you to come back, but if you want to come back, come back. <laughs> so without, Without feeling any pressure, my brother didn't want to do it, my sister didn't want to do it, so it was pretty much it was me or nothing. I said, you know what, I'm going to do this for a year or two, maybe three years, help the family business, and then figure out what I want to do with my life. That was 30 years ago, and I found pretty much what I want to do with my life. Um, so this one slide, full disclosure, I had this whole slide presentation, and this is my first talk with slides, and now it's become a slide. I didn't want to get um, messed up. But this slide tells you my journey in the 80s. I read every business book ever published to get ideas to lead my company better. The one that I liked the most at the time was Tom Peters. Um, 
in search of excellence, which that's what I was doing. I was searching for excellence. And stick to the knitting. And all his ideas seemed great at the time. But whenever I tried to implement anything, I never moved the needle. And it was always chaos. It was always confusion. It was always frustration. It was always financial problems. So I read another book, and I read another book, and I read another book, and I read another book. And finally, I gave up reading because I knew that none of these books were helpful. They were more for the authors to make money than really helping business owners manage the businesses. So in 1993, my largest customer at the time, Yu Hosiery, which has moved since to North Carolina and to China, sent all their vendors a memo, 40-page memo, essentially saying, you must improve your quality. They didn't, they didn't tell you how to do it. They didn't tell you what was involved. They just gave you an edict. Either improve your quality or you're out. So now I'm reading again. Quality was my new mantra. Quality this, quality that. And I read Crosby. I read uh, a lot of different people. And then every time I went anywhere, it was always Dr. Deming. Dr. Deming. Dr. Deming. So finally I said, this guy must be an expert. I started reading everything I could get my hands on. Out of the Crisis is a wonderful book. And I was able to relate to my company. Every page I turned, you could insert New York label and take out a, a, the average manufacturing company. So now I had it. Now I was in my zone. Now I knew that this was going to be our way forward. And I happened to read a book by Rafael Aguayo, uh, if the Japanese can, why can't we, I believe is the title. Raphael, coincidentally, was in Brooklyn. We got together. And he was our, our mentor for a few years. And I remember the first project was a pressman complaining that he spent two hours mixing an ink at press. At the time, that was, that was normal SOP. We had, we had very talented people. They would mix the ink. Meanwhile, the press that you're supposed to be making money on is sitting idle, papers wasted. So our first project was the PDSA how to make the press run more. Got a team together. We said, well, why don't we have an ink lab? And someone said, well, that's a waste of time. That's a waste of money. Why should we hire somebody to do this? I said, well, I'd rather hire one guy to mix ink for six presses at the time than have six presses mixing ink. And you pretty quickly do the math. It was an amazing way to start the journey because it was so powerful that it worked so well. All of a sudden, the presses were up and running more. All of a sudden, the presses were wasting less paper, and we were getting better quality, which we had an actual ink lab. So that, that was very lucky that we had such a successful project going forward that we were able to convince everybody this is the way. We spent a lot of years on the 14 points in developing the culture. We did a wonderful job driving out fear. We did a wonderful job understanding the performance appraisals don't work. And at the end of the day, every time a Deming theory came up, it was, to me, so logical, so simple, and as, Ellie, as Kelly uses, so elegant that I always bought into it. Now, running the company, then it's my job to make sure everyone is on board. Um, so now we kind of stalled. We kind of stalled out because I think we spent too much time on the culture, too much time on the 14 points. And in the, in the early 2000s, we were doing very well sales-wise because the economy, we were, we were not doing very well profit-wise. And we kind of went into a period of uh, two steps forward, one step back in the early 2000s, and we were a little bit lost. Another great example that propelled us towards systems thinking that I'll share with you. I had a press that these, uh, our average management team right now has been with us for 20 years. I've been doing this for 30 years. So that's a testament, I think, to the power of Deming. It makes sense. People get it. They want to improve. So a gentleman at the time, he's, uh, Pressman's been with me 30 years now. At the time, it was, uh, I don't know, 20. And in the, uh, the good, old, good old days, we had one press printing black ink. We had one press printing blue ink. We had one press printing red ink, one press process. Today, the complexity is off the charts. But back then, this one pressman, he was an early pressman, he would print black ink all the time. Customer calls me up. I ordered, black, I ordered red. I got black. So I'm saying to myself, OK, we're a Deming company. We could probably figure this out. And some people wanted to just blame him. You know, you're literally an idiot for printing 
black instead of red, and he's, he's now angry. We had this whole battle going on. Someone said, okay, we've got to analyze our job tickets. Maybe the, 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 he misread red or black. And for days and days and days, he is just adamant that he did not make this error when he knew deep down he did. So we're digging, 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 digging. It turns out in the morning he had 16 black jobs to run. My father, God love him, decided his customer needed this red ink job very quickly. Joey's a great pressman. I'm sliding it in the middle. So by the time Joey hit his stride with the seventh and eighth job, he wasn't looking at which ink was. He saw he had 16 black jobs. All of a sudden, that red job that the customer wanted became black. So it's the system. And those kinds of examples strengthened the worker in saying, that wasn't my mistake, that's a system mistake. Why don't you guys continue to work on the system? And management, get, got it. So now we're into systems thinking, we're getting rid of the performance appraisals, and we're kind of cruising along. But complexity is becoming more challenging, price is becoming low, and frankly, our quality was great. I'm sorry, it was good, but not great. A lot of frustration, a lot of rejects, a lot of customer complaints, a lot of reworks. So we said, okay, we need a head of quality internally. I picked the guy who I thought was going to be the best candidate. He was the head of my prep team in 2007. And I said, okay, you are in charge of quality. We all believe in Deming. We're stalled. What do we do? His first thing to me was, I need training, education. Great. Do whatever you want to do. Buy whatever book you want to buy. I said, it's just better, whatever you do, it has to be Deming. We are going the route of Deming, continuing the route of Deming. Comes to my office a day later, he said, there's a two and a half day seminar in Washington, DC. I said, don't even tell me the cost, just go and learn and bring back all the knowledge and may wave a magic wand and improve our quality. He comes back, comes back, he sits in my office, he said, the program was run by a gentleman named Kelly Allen. Wonderful speaker. I learned more in two and a half days than I've learned in the last uh, 15 years, but we can't afford him. So I said, we can, we can talk to him. We'll, you know, we'll talk to him. We'll see what he said. <laughs> it was very clear we could not afford him at the time because we were financially uh, close to bankruptcy. So I called Kelly. I said, Kelly, uh, Anthony had a wonderful time at your seminar. I know I can't afford you. Could you help us? Kelly's response in the Deming way, in the win-win, We'll work something out. We fly him in, and that to me was the, br the bringing in of an outside consultant who has the knowledge, like Gordon mentioned, just, you don't want to just talk to anybody, was a tremendous step forward for us in that we were able to then to really analyze the systems, really get deeper understanding, and really we took quality to, a, to, to the level where we were doing less re rework. We had less customer complaints. We were able to, to watch the quality go to a higher level. And interestingly enough, uh, a vitamin company was looking for a new, they had six label vendors, $2 billion company, six label vendors. We were not one of them because their purchasing people felt, we have six, we don't need another one. Fortunately for us, they hired an art director that went to the VP of purchasing and said, your six label people cannot print the quality of the, the design that we have. Let me go out and find a label company that can actually do my wonderful designs that you're paying me to do. Got a call from a buddy of mine, another printer, and he said, uh, I know the art director is looking for a quality pr a label printer. I recommended your name. Fine. They come in. They interview us. They audit us. And flexographic printing in the 60s was like rubber stamp printing. And a lot of people still had that perception that you really can't get super sharp quality with flexographic printing, but to do labels on rolls for packaging, they had to have it. So it comes in, we print a job for them. The uh, art director said, this is my toughest design. If you can print this, I can get you this business. I guarantee it. I have the, the head of uh, purchasing behind me, and there's an internal war going on, which the purchasing people are saying, we've got six guys. Make this new guy run at one of these six guys. And the art director is saying, there's no way you can do it. Let me pick my outside guy. He brings a team of people in. They look at our sample, and they said, this wasn't printed flex, so this was printed offset. And we look, we, you know, we were, internally, we're looking at each other. We said, we have no offset press here, so I'm not sure exactly how that would happen. And 
he said, show me your factory. So we showed him the factory. Sure enough, you know, now it's 10 label presses. It's all, all flexible. So you want me to put it on? I'll put it on. And he said, no, 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 that's OK, that's OK. So we were rated the highest label quality printer by a $2 billion company. And it is because of Deming. It is because of Deming's theories of give the power to the people that are doing the job. Give those people the tools they are requesting. Give them the right materials. Put them in, a, in an environment of quality. And then have the systems built around that. And I think it's, uh, it's such a, a powerful concept that all the workers buy into. Um, and it's just a continuous, continuous, continuous improvement. The current project we're working on, coincidentally, Kelly Man uh, mentioned the company who he was on the conference call with, where the managers were in the room, where we, the company has one vision but a divided management team. That was us. 2014, we're still learning. We're, we, you don't know what you don't know. And it dawned on us years ago that leadership was our the piece of the puzzle that we really had to conquer because half the management team believed in command and control, half the management team truly believed in Deming, and without understanding it at the time, we were in constant conflict. In the last three months, probably, with Kelly's guidance, we have taken the management team and brought them together. And now not only do we have one vision, but we have one unified leadership team that understands that you can't have two different styles of leadership, and that has helped us. Um, that's also helped us tremendously. So I want to talk a little bit about innovation and what we're doing, um, because it, it, it's an essential ingredient today. And when you think about all the General Motors stories of quality problems, when you understand that Companies want not a 5% reduction or a 10% reduction in price. They want a 20%, 25% reduction in price. You're only going to get that through innovation. You're only going to break the old mold through innovation. So what, we, what we've done is we have tried to look at how the client, which is an essential part of the system, is going to be two, three years down the road and we take the innovation component, and we, we drive it on two forces. Once the the, you have to drive innovation on the quality front, because as the Deming chain reaction says, that's how you're going to get your waste reduction. That's how you're going to get your productivity uh, improvements. That's how you're going to create jobs. That's how you're going to stay in business. And the innovation part is to brand yourself as this company that is going to be able to do different things in the future. The, uh, not only the price issue today of r radically and ridiculously low prices is upon us, the competitive landscape is such that if you don't have a brand concept for your customer to understand that you're going to be with them in the future, you are going to have a very, very rocky road. And for us, the innovation becomes very exciting because you have a bunch of good people, you have a bunch of really smart people, who are working together to come up with new ideas, it, it's not only stimulating and inspiring, it's just it's good business. It just makes a lot of sense. And what happens then is the vendors come to you and say, hey, you seem like you're innovative. I have a new UV that I'd like you to test. And it turns out, six months ago, uh, my guy was talking to this uh, UV vendor, a coding vendor. And he said, you guys really seem like you know what you're doing. Would you mind if I came in and we have a conversation? They bring the vendor in. Also, client part of the system, vendor part of the system. He says, I've been to four different companies, and no one can do with our UV that I know is possible, but I have yet to find the company that do it. My guys are salivating. They're seeing the potential of this tactile, raised effect, all in line. And I could just see the. The energy in the room was unbelievable. The vendor said, you know, I'll leave you with as much as you need. Get back to me whenever you can. I leave the room, and these guys are just they're drawing on the walls. They're uh, brainstorming. And the first three trials fail. And we pretty much understood, like Edison, we understood what wouldn't work. We understood what the competitors did that didn't work. But we knew that this product was going to be good. 
So the innovation team reconvenes, and the innovation team is really just a bunch of different people from uh, different uh, departments that are excited and smart, really smart. And now they said, okay, we need something different. Are there any printers in the room? Are you a Flexo printer? No. Good. I'm going to give the secret <laughs> of how we did this. What we did, what my guy came up with is, what was happening is the ink would be put in dots, like little bubbles, to create like a water-like effect. And it was kind of getting smushed down. So my guy said, and I'll tell you, when we did this, uh, you know, that was a theory, that was the PDSA. And I said, that sounds unbelievable. Let's do it. Spent money, we do it. And the, the excitement in the room, you would have think we landed, the, the NASA, you would have think we landed a spaceship on, on Mars, but that's what gets guys excited in printing. Call the vendor up, that's it, you did it, I knew someone could do it. I'm going to introduce you to Coke. Have you ever heard of Coke? I think everyone's heard of Coke. The, head, the guy gives me, here's his business card, you know. John Smith, Executive Vice President, Marketing, Coca-Cola Division. So the story has a bad ending, and here it is. I fly to Atlanta, I meet this guy. He sent us, uh, he said, I'm going to give you Sprite artwork. This is the real deal. I go back to the plant. They've given us Sprite artwork. We do the tactile. It's an amazing water-like effect. You would think you'd pull the label out of a, a cooler. Sent the art to the uh, gentleman from Coca-Cola. He says, I, this is unbelievable. Uh, the UV guy's been promising me for this years. No one's ever given it to me. You've done it. We'd like you to send us the plates. We'd like to send your idea to Russia. We're going to experiment in Russia. And we're sitting around scratching our heads, and we said, this is, doesn't seem like it's any good for us. And I pretty much said, I said, I said we operate on a win-win philosophy. This looks like you're the big winner, and we're the big loser. So we're still in, uh, in negotiations how to make that work. But the, at the end of the day, that, so that innovation becomes not really industry-wide, but now we have a vendor behind us that's good. Every new idea they get, we're going to get a first shot at it. And then he talks to other vendors. So the innovation piece is, is incredibly important. Uh, it doesn't always work out, but we have one of the biggest marketers in the world who knows about us, who didn't know about us before. So that's on the innovation thing. The other funny part, and one of the reasons I'm here, is Kelly knows that I'm okay making fun of myself. And I want to backtrack a little bit. Um, prior to knowing uh, the Deming theory, and in our quest for quality is free and do it right the first time and all these crazy ideas, we had a quality day. And we had balloons. And we had, we had excitement. And we had a picnic outside. And we released these balloons. We go back to work the next day, and quality still wasn't free, and we still couldn't do it right the first time. <laughs> and at some point, it, it, it was, it was, it's almost comical looking back now, but the, you don't know what you don't know. And until my largest customer came to me with the edict of improving quality, it was never our mission. Our mission, honestly, was always to be great. And we, we are, our, our theme, the Deming theme, uh, which I love, our theme at the time was teamwork working together, communication, excellence. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, those three things are pretty powerful. But at the end of the day, it's not systems thinking. It's not continuous improvement. It doesn't get everybody on board. And really, we were kind of floundering. So part of the journey is the early, early years where there's a tremendous amount of frustration, a tremendous amount of learning. And until you really have that, that deeper knowledge, coupled with truly an outsider and an insider, um, it really does um, take some time to figure out. But at the end of the day, once you get it, it just becomes a, uh, the ball gets bigger rolling down the hill. And that's what we've experienced. So I want to share some advice. Um, like I said, number one, you have to have an expert. You just, there's just no way to read all the Deming books out there and figure it out. Uh, believe me, I'm a testament to that. I read every Deming book. It is, while simple and elegant, it is also so all-encompassing and so many ideas that you learn in school, whether it's achieving goals, management by objective, 
performance appraisals. And that's another thing that I bought into the Deming. All his ideas just made sense. I can't tell you the amount of time in the 80s that we spent on rating people and how are you performing and all that time was completely wasted. I think our HR department may have had three people in it. And you just say to yourself, if we can get the people to work harder, one year, and again, I'm embarrassed to admit this, we had a full company meeting at the end of the year. We reported the results, which were blasé, but OK. And I said, next year, we are going to work harder. I literally said this. We are going, this is the 80s, we are going to work harder, and we are going to do a better job. Rah, rah, here we go. Next year, we did worse. <laughs> so in my infinite wisdom, I sat around before the meeting. What am I going to say to this group of committed people, great people? We're going to work smarter. Yeah, work smarter. That's the key. That year, worse results than the two years prior. So you don't know what you don't know. And most people are very committed. And part of Deming's theory is pride in workmanship. People want to do a good job. And I always say to the guys in the early years who would have five bad days in a row, Let's go and make it so you have one good day in a row this week. One. That's all I want is one good day. And we focused on the materials coming in. And they're not dusty. We focused on, is your press better maintained? And, and our, all our focus was on what we call the Gemba, which was the heart of our, you know, any printing operation. And I don't want to say miraculously, but coincidentally, they had a good day. And a month later, they had two good days. And now we probably have four out of five good days. And that fifth day can be really, really, really bad. But it's mostly because of the complexity. It's not really due to the fact we don't get it. It's not due to the fact that our systems aren't pretty tight. But at the end of the day, the, as the complexity goes up, your systems have to continually improve. And we're getting very good at understanding how to improve the systems. Because we have a, uh, the whole company now, all 75 of us, truly have an understanding of what systems thinking is. And without the Deming behind us, our, the complexity challenge in the marketplace today would have swamped us terribly. So now, advice number one, get uh, outside help. Advice number two, you need an internal person that's going to be the champion. Not just the, while the owner has to be committed, you really need a quality expert internally to really focus everybody on the understanding of systems thinking. Third, everyone's got to learn. Everyone in your organization has got to be continually learning at whatever speed they can learn at, so there's a, a general knowledge base that everyone can be committed to the uh, outcome of improving quality. Lastly, to do a tremendous job on PDSAs and getting pockets of the organization working to improve their part of the organization, working to improve the systems, and, pr and predicting what would happen if we do this. And you have that almost experimentational mindset. If it's formalized, you really are able to improve systems that people can see, they, like the ink experiment. They saw the press running more. They saw less stock being wasted. It was validated with the data of we were buying less stock and, and making customers happy. And it, it, it is truly powerful. Last, uh, second to last, when Kelly came aboard and my quality guy came back from the conference, and I'm a, I'm, I'm a little bit of uh, the mindset where I kind of wing everything, the first thing he said was, if you don't, create, and if the company doesn't have a constancy of purpose and a vision, I don't want the job. So with my psychology background, I figured I can talk him into keeping the job. <laughs> it's his job. He's his salary. And he keeps saying to me, we need a vision. We need constancy of purpose. We've got to get the management team in a room. We've got to figure it out. So in 2007, I finally just gave in. He was more persistent than I was. We came up with a vision, a five-year vision that truly did take us to a height that I never thought we could get to. In 2013, we had more 
success with clients bragging about us, which is a Deming word, you have to have one of your, I don't want to say a goal, but one part of the result, the end result of great systems is having clients that brag about you. And we talk about it all the time. And at the end of the day, when you can get a client bragging about you, it truly energizes everybody because it, it, it reflects the pride of workmanship that you're really trying to achieve. Lastly, on the, my advice is create the metrics that are going to allow you to figure things out, to, to understand what needs to get done in terms of improving quality. And I think that that, um, that lesson is I think a lot of times we look at the wrong things. We look at the bottom line too much. We look at the top line too much. And I think you, know, you, you, you talk about, you look at performance appraisals too much. You have to figure out and you have to dig down to look at the systems that are going to make the biggest impact to improve your operation. We talk about low-hanging fruit. I think what happens in our journey, the low-hanging fruit is easy. You pick things off. The ink lab, in retrospect, was pretty simple. And you have to figure out not really just the low-hanging fruit to get people to understand it, but you've got to figure out the big stuff. You've got to figure out what's really going to make the big impact. I'd like to share one story of a client that brags about us. Um, it is a cosmetic brand. They're a wonderful company. They've been in business since 1851. We're 1878, and in, we think in about the 50s, we started dealing with them, we're not 100% sure, but in 2001, they were a $40 million company, family, four, uh, third generation family business, and Jamie decided to sell to L'Oreal for $100 million. Nice payday. And it's funny because their whole brand was quality. And it really, it's very powerful that if you have such a brand like that, how it, it helps you sell, um, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting weapon in, in the fight of competition. So 2001, L'Oreal takes over. And our fear was they are going to drive costs down. They are going to get away from the quality. They're not going to appreciate our quality. Um, and it turned out good for us because L'Oreal said kind of, we're going to take the hands-off approach to most of the big companies like L'Oreal, they want billion dollar brands and here they got a $40 million company, they weren't even really paying attention. But by not paying attention, they were able to continue their quality focus and, and grow. We right now do 99% of all labels and it's, it's such a partnership. It would be the case study that a Deming expert would say, this is how a vendor and a customer need to work together. And the good news has been L'Oreal has been virtually hands off. But the first thing they did was took our 13 cent label and made it nine cents. We were, okay, we can deal with that. The, you know, they promised new volume. We didn't sacrifice quality. Uh, they didn't ask us to do anything crazy. 13 to nine, we can live with that. We go back to our systems. We go back to our improvement process. We can do nine cents with the growth. Next year, L'Oreal's edict is 3%, at the time, 3% cost reduction every year. And I scratch my head and I'm saying to myself, you can't have 3% less payroll. You can't have 3% less technology. But with the increased volume, we'll see what happens. So they said, so I'm thinking in my mind, you know, being a quick math major, nine cents, less three percent, we can handle it. I sit down, prepared to take the three percent hit. We want six cents. Doing a quick math, that's not three <laughs> percent. And, and I said to them, I said, what happened to three percent? Oh, that's gone. We think this is the market value, whatever. So then, you know, their volume grew to about 10 million labels in 2005, six cents a piece, 600 grand. Wonderful customer, wonderful relationship, and all of a sudden the brand took off. They then started doing fold outs. We had to innovate for them to do that. They started doing resealable. We had to innovate for them to do that. And the, the cross communication, the teamwork between their engineers and our engineers is unbelievable. I mean, it really is unbelievable. They did in 2006 
600,000 labels. In 2012, they did 30 million labels, all with one company. And I mentioned before had six. The reason is most companies collapse when a growing company gives them too much work. The quality goes down, the delivery goes down, they bring in another vendor. They make it more complex for them, more headaches, more uh, challenges, because now they're dealing with two companies. And sure enough, what normally happens, and Estee Lauder has 14 label people, what normally happens, they bring in a third. They brought in six people to handle that work. Said, if you guys can handle it, we will keep giving it to you. When you screw up, we're bringing a second vendor. So we had the challenge of saying, we need to continuously improve systems. We gotta drive costs down. We have to improve delivery. Last year, 33 million labels. Our quality rating was 99.8%. Our delivery rating was 99.6%. So now we go around joking. There's the, you know, the quality type guys, our quality is better rating, and the delivery of the production guys, well, our delivery is pretty damn good. Calls us in every year for the audit, and they essentially said, we have never seen any vendor that has the growth and the capacity to stay with us while maintaining such a high quality and delivery rating. And you talk about pride of workmanship and customer bragging and internally, the energy and excitement. We can have running on five different presses, five different types of work, and the excitement, truly internal excitement when we do a big shipment, of, of, which is probably twice a week, you know, 40 years later it is unbelievable. And the, without the Deming systems thinking, without the continuous improvement, I guarantee you there'd at least be three label people, if not maybe six. But for us, with this philosophy, with help from uh, Mr. Allen, we have been able to have a partnership of cooperation and innovation and driving costs down. Um, it's remarkable. And the funny thing is, in 2012, they said to us, we're, we're going to grow 20% and get ready. OK, we bought a new press, hired a pressman, trained everybody. We're ready, we're ready, we're ready. Their sales go down 10%. OK, we're pretty much, you know, that, that takes a hit, but you know, we were OK. We go in for the next year, and they said, uh, we want an 8% reduction. I said, do you remember what happened last year? Do you remember the 20% promise and 10% down? They said, OK, we'll settle for four. And we settled for four. And sure enough, you know, we, through 13, and now this year, we're, we're having an even better year than last year. But the, at the end of the day, now L'Oreal is getting involved. Now you can tell L'Oreal is becoming, now that they're a $600 million company, and they're shooting for a billion, now it's, it's the, the gloves are off in the L'Oreal side, and they're tasting another brand that might be able to make it to a billion. And there, there's, uh, we're having some challenges there. But um, at the end of the day, the quality systems thinking piece has enabled to, us to do something in, in truly in printing that is really remarkable and, uh, and quite unheard of. I'm going to do it on time here. I'm good. So my last remark, the other dimension for us, now Deming is a part of our marketing. And we have all our salespeople talking about Deming to clients. We have our, we have a truck. Uh, where's the slot? You, can you pop up one more slot? Can, can I do this? Can you? Uh, I need one more slide. Can you, can you give me one more slide after this, I think? We're working on it. You get the All right. <laughs> no, that's out. That's out. So I mean, it, well, so, so, right here, you can see, you know, this is our 14-point list with our name in the bottom, with Dr. Deming, a little bio there. And we have that on every conference room wall, every training center wall. And, and people, customers come in, and they start reading this. They're like, wow, this is really cool. This makes a lot of sense. I wish my boss would do some of these things. I, I'm, I'm living in constant fear. I'll give me one more slide. I'm hoping. All our marketing, where's the good doctor? Right in the middle, right in the middle. 
stresses, Dr. Deming. It really differentiates us. And then the final slide, I'm so jacked up I can do slides now. <laughs> Our final one is we have a, we don't have, in the struggling years we had no trucks, now we have a, a, an, HU, an SUV and two of these, and we did a wrap uh, in Deming's on our wrap. And the funny story is a customer called me and they said, I just saw your truck. It's unbelievable. You know, driving on the LA, I just saw your truck. It's unbelievable. Who is this? Who is on the side? They thought it was maybe my grandfather, my father. I said, no, that's Dr. Deming. He's our guy. And um, it's amazing how, uh, how uh, customers are into it. Okay, that's my story. That's my journey. I got 15 minutes or so for questions. <coughs> We printed those. Way, printed <laughs> That's my give back to the Deming, because Deming has really it's changed my life, it's changed the company, it's truly really helped us survive, and uh, it's just an amazing testament. And like I said in the podcast, I think, my goal in life is to create a company so Deming-esque, so theoretically correct, that we become a, um, an example of companies to look to when they say, you know, talking about TQM and the quality revolution, and that really, part of that mission really everyone is into, and it just, it just helps itself going, going forward. Right here. Good one. So you talked about um, having your management being divided into the more traditional... Command and control. Yeah. So how did you bring the two together? Um, Repeat the question. Okay. You want to ask him? Okay, well, what she's asking is, as Kelly used my company as an example, half the management team was command and control. And we didn't understand it at the time. Because there are different things. Certain people would be command and control certain times, Deming other times, and you never really were able to step back and understand it and dig deeper. But it finally dawned on me, and what, what was happening, and unfortunately, out of the top was me and three others at the top, six other people to make up the ten. What I realized when I stepped back, my top three, two of the four were command and control. So me and the quality guy, that's the other thing. If your quality guy's not very high up in your organization, people aren't going to get it. They're not going to understand. You can't have a third level guy be your head of quality. Your head of quality must be at the top rung of senior management. So what was happening was, and even, even, he, even he was a little, at times, command and control. Think of myself, this is going to be on video, they're going to all be all over me. <laughs> they're all great people, I love them to death. <laughs> at, at the end of the day, what was happening was, and people believed that they, they would hide behind systems thinking to put rules in place. A lot of times these rules weren't really doing anything except trying to manipulate people with their thinking. And when we got together, and I have said for the last three years, leadership is an important cognitive. And we don't, I knew it screws up work. I have great relationships with most of my workers, which we've been working together for so long. The average manager, 20 years. A lot of the workers are 20, 25 years. And they'll come to me and they'll say, your company can do better. I'm not going to tell you where it's getting, who's screwing it up, but trust me, there's still things that need to be improved. And I say to them, you know, let's work on it. And one of my managers, when I, every time I say we got to improve leadership, what do you mean by that? And I, and I would say, we need to be better leaders. But we never really had a system or a PDSA to improve the leadership until recently when I, I figured out the fact that this was our last big major hurdle. And knowing that Debbie is a genius, Kelly's one step below Debbie, and I'm way down here, I got Kelly's help, and we identified the root cause of the issue was people still believe in the command and control. It's very anti Debbie, and it screws everything up. And what we did was we then had a, a weekly Monday lunch meeting where come hell or high water, we were going to figure out the leadership component and we were going to figure out how to improve it. And a little bit of education, it was a little bit of, of laughter, and um, 
Kelly then, fortunately, after three or four weeks, had a scheduled visit. And when he came in, we got everybody together. And then he gets animated and slams tables and starts yelling at people. And, and now we're not there yet. I don't think people fully get the piece of how important leadership is and how bad command control is. But we're working towards having not only one vision, but one leadership team that is taking that vision and spreading it throughout the company. So it's sort of a work in progress. Um, but it, it, it's, amazing, it's an amazing journey. It's an amazing aha moment where we really saw the two theories in, in, in place and we're now trying to break it down and uh, understand what we're doing on a daily basis that's screwing everything up uh, based on going away from Deming. And um, at the next podcast, I'll keep you posted. Next question. Here we go. Okay. Do you ever fire people? Uh, it's a funny, it's almost a question. We have a system of people where I try to do it. At the end of the day, I try to do it because I understand how, how important it is to people. And my big thing is if I'm firing a person, they are going to know it. They are not going to question why they're getting fired, which they've been told about 10 to 20 times you need to improve. What we do to not fire people, because we understand variation, and some people are going to be above average, some people below average, some people average. We put people in different roles. We try to train them. And, and Kelly mentioned it. You don't hire dead wood. You create dead wood. You don't, the average person is going to do a good job if they're in the right systems, if they have the right leadership, if they get the proper training, and that's all in the company. And I don't know if it's 4% of the time or 20% of the time, I'm not a statistician, but if they can't do that job, there's probably something in a manufacturing company that they can do. After we move you three times, that's when we know and you know you're probably not a good fit and you're probably going to get fired but you're, A, you're going to know you're going to get fired. B, you're going to get a severage package. And C, we do it in such a way where my managers joke, one out of two people, when I fire them, hug me goodbye. One out of two people call me in a week or two and say, you did the right thing. I wasn't a good fit for printing. I'm now doing this, and thank you for firing me. And that's, if you can do that, you've done a pretty good job. Um, We're talking about firing. How about things you look for in hiring? Yeah, you know what? I'm, uh, I'm not an expert on hiring, and I, I think what we try to do is hire people that are competent in the interview where they're not stumbling over themselves, and we have a pretty good idea of what the role is, and we let them know that role. I think we have a, an SOP book where we say, this is the role. We let them know. We, we, we're pretty much open, and we say, this is the role. Do you think you can handle it? I mean, does your experience qualify you to handle this role? We always have at least three interviews with different, peop uh, different people in our organization. And um, it's very tricky. But like I said, at the end of the day, there's something they can do because they're going to be above average, below average, or average. And we got you know, 15 classifications of jobs. And we pretty much find people that can um, do one of those various jobs. And a lot, of it's, a lot of it's training and more of it's in systems, which it's not and this is, this is a big part people have a problem with. As much as you want to feel like you're this superstar and you're wonderful and smart and brilliant, you can be, but if you have a terrible system, I don't care who you are. If Michael Jordan had four really bad players on his team in a bad system, he would never have won a championship. And you know, he's outside the system, and you, know, you try to talk to people and you try to have as few people as possible outside the system, but a lot of people think they're outside the system, and they're actually they're not. What's that? They all do. So, you know, you've got to build teamwork in. You've got to have people understand the system. And at the end of the day, they'll appreciate it. But when they screw up, then it's the system. And you can buy that. I mean, that's, uh, that, that's just what you do. Other questions? Right here. Come, come. Blue shirt. I want to know uh, what did you do or what changes did you make when you said you were going through bankruptcy or, or near bankruptcy? You were the lean times. What did you do? And, and, and the second part of that is, 
how did you have the the vision to send your quality guy to two and a half days with Kelly here? Okay, I'll answer that first question. I didn't have the vision. <laughs> he said, I need training. I said, go get yourself training. I didn't, I didn't know there was a two and a half day seminar out there, uh, which is my bad. Um, and he said, can I go? And I said, yeah, go. When it, you know, when it, is it a month from now? Yeah, go. You know, get yourself a train ticket, whatever. So you know, I'll give him the credit for that. And he's, my, he's one of the top four managers, head of quality, great guy. Um, and your first question was bankruptcy. Here, here's the funny story. So we're doing poorly. And what happens when you're close to bankruptcy is you panic a lot. You're very frustrated. You kind of lose focus on the Deming thing. And I knew I was in trouble when my accountant said to me, I'd like you to meet some lawyers. I said, lawyers? Why, why would I need to meet lawyers? What kind of lawyers? They're bankruptcy lawyers. And I sat in that meeting with them, and I'm looking at them, and they're telling me, you know, you can wipe out your vendor debt and your restructure your bank. I'm like, well, that doesn't seem win-win. I said, I would win, but they would lose. And what would happen? And, and uh, my accountant said, I'm doing my job to show you that's what you should do. As an expert, I'm telling you, and I said, well, you know, they talk about the crazy ones. I am certifiably crazy. And I said, we're not doing this. And I got my bank. I got my biggest vendors. My biggest vendor, paper vendor, had over a million dollars of invoices to us. Some of them were as old as six months. Six months old, and they kept shipping us. I did sign a personal guarantee. Um, but they kept shipping us. And the relationship there between you know, a, a vendor of ours and us is priceless. It's priceless. They, they could have made a phone call and put me out of business. They said, look, here's what we'll do. You sign a personal guarantee. When you, know, when you recover and get your uh, money within 60 days, we'll, we'll wipe it out. And they knew I could file for bankruptcy before the personal guarantee. What's the personal guarantee? They said, you want to file for bankruptcy? Fine, you're still going to owe us that money. But it is, it is, it's a wake-up call, but at the time, you don't realize the power of quality to make the adjustments to your financial situation until you start doing it, until you start really seeing it. But yeah, that was a, uh, a tremendous, uh, tremendously powerful wake-up call on, on the journey. And um, thank God I didn't file for bankruptcy. My vendors love us to death now. Um, they're with us 100% of the time. They come to us with innovations, as I spoke about. And um, it's the best thing I never did. And I didn't do it because I knew it wasn't win-win. And that, again, that's a big, that's a big Deming philosophy. Time for one more. We've got about four minutes coming. How has your experience with the Deming philosophy influenced the rest of your life? Uh, I think, it, I think the, the essence of, for me, the essence of the Deming philosophy is continuously improve. And whether it's um, with my health, whether it's with my kids, whether it's with my friends, whether it's with my financial situation, you just focus on not setting goals, certainly not hairy goals, but you just focus on how can I improve? And it's not necessarily today or this week, but this year. What, what, what can I do individually, personally, to improve? How can I be a better person? How can I be a better leader? How can we, um, you know, how can I have more fun in life? And I think that the, the essence of the Deming philosophy is continually improve. And if you're doing that, you can't be going in the wrong direction. You may, you know, there are twists and turns, but at the end of the day, it, it, it's all about continuous improvement. Time for one quick one. Three minutes. Yes. He asked me a question before, so watch out. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on lean, which is really popular right now? Uh, that's um, not only am I crazy, I'm not that smart. I don't, I don't do anything unless it's Deming. If it's not, if it's not Deming, I don't, want, I don't want any part of it. Because it, it is, can, everything else, it's like, it's like the business books. To me, you know, lean is another way of saying, you know, lean is another way of saying drive out waste, i.e. quality, i.e. continuous improvement, and watch everything go. And, and lean is, you know, the same concept as Deming, but Deming to me is just so, he so meticulously outlined a vision for a business to follow in the 14 points and the train reaction and the system uh, SOPK that just anything else to me is static. I don't want to know it. I don't care about it. And uh, it's working for me. So I'm going with it. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you.